Monty Python inspired absurdity, Scientology controversies, and post-COVID satire. Comedy Central's South Park has never shied away from controversy. Is it the holy grail of animated sitcoms or just plain sacrilegious? South Park creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker owe a great deal of credit to Monty Python, the British sketch comedy collective that rose to prominence in the 1960s and 70s with their unique brand of absurd satirical humor. The group consisted of comedy icons including John Cleese, Graham Chapman, and Eric Idle, whose many projects heavily influenced Parker and Stone throughout the early development process of South Park. Particularly, the show's iconic art style was influenced by the Terry Gilliam animations that introduced their BBC sketch series Monty Python's Flying Circus. Over the years, Stone and Parker have had the opportunity to pay tribute to their comedy heroes. In celebration of the troupe's 50th anniversary, they contributed a South Park recreation of the iconic dead parrot sketch, with Cartman attempting to return a dead Kenny to the friend store. I'll tell you what's wrong with him, my lad. He's dead! No, 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 he's, uh, he's resting. The troupe's reunion show at the O2 in London in 2014 was apparently sparked by the South Park duo, although Idol jokingly countered this claim in a Reddit AMA by saying, they are arrogant little twerps trying to get cheap publicity off our backs. Idol's comment was likely in jest, given that the comedian provided the voice of Dr. Vosnacher and South Park bigger, longer, and uncut. The South Park duo also had a relationship with Python member and film director Terry Gilliam, who once advised the two to not overextend themselves across several projects. That advice was promptly ignored as the pair produced South Park alongside several feature films. Oh, it's you! Alright, buddy, you stop that right now! This is our show! <laughs> Hey, I'm not fat, I'm big boned! The success of South Park has been the subject of discussion in the entertainment industry ever since it first premiered. It's not incredibly surprising that the show took off given its success as a viral video in the internet's infancy, but the first episode's debut on Comedy Central in 1997 was no accident either. Unfortunately, test audiences weren't responsive to the series' first episode, which made the network hesitate in giving the boys a further chance. Season 1 was nevertheless the subject of a fierce marketing campaign by Comedy Central as a last-ditch effort to draw attention to it. South Park even labeled itself as the reason for parents to install a V-chip in their television to monitor their children's viewing habits. Even before the first episode premiered, Comedy Central had already raked in a fortune in t-shirt sales, proving that the series was to be an inevitable success. South Park is also responsible for changing public opinion of Comedy Central as a network entirely. It had as much of an influence on modern-day TV as shows like The Simpsons, but the appeal of South Park to a newer generation made it a surefire success for the network and the show's creators. Outside the world of internet memes and pop culture, South Park has even influenced the world of law. The show's frequent mocking of celebrity songs and moments have drawn plenty of discussion over fair use and parody law, like the time when Butters performed a viral song originally made by the internet personality Samwell. The resulting lawsuit was eventually dismissed, but it set a precedent concerning fair use laws. South Park has also pervaded the lexicon of not just American culture, but of the American court system as well. This influence started in the Season 2 episode Chef Aid, which revolves around chefs suing Alanis Morissette for plagiarizing him. Hired by Morissette's record label, celebrity lawyer Johnny Cochran, who notably defended O.J. Simpson during his widely publicized murder trial, successfully argues for his client by using what's now known as the Chewbacca defense. Why would a Wookiee, an eight-foot-tall Wookiee, want to live on indoor with a bunch of two-foot-tall Ewoks? That does not make sense! Although Chewbacca himself isn't often mentioned in lawsuits, the term Chewbacca defense now blankets any argument made by the prosecution or defense that is meant to deliberately confuse the jury. As recently as 2022, the South Park episode was referenced during a federal tax fraud case in Jacksonville, Florida. However, the argument's efficacy when not employed by Cochran and South Park hasn't had much success. Even though South Park had only been airing on Comedy Central for two seasons in 1999, it had already become a pop cultural phenomenon. Naturally, this warranted a transition to the big screen, with Parker and Stone co-producing the first South Park feature film, South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. Parker assumed directorial duties for the film, which he co-wrote with Stone and veteran South Park writer Pam Brady. The film centers on the typical South Park kid sneaking into an R-rated screen of Terrence and Philip. The foul language in the movie gets them to start swearing, resulting in a nationwide panic that causes the United States to declare war on Canada. Just remember what the MPAA says. Horrific, deplorable violence is okay, as long as people don't say any naughty words. If that wasn't wild enough on its own, the whole thing is a musical featuring some delightfully vulgar songs. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut was well-received. Washington Post critic Rita Kempley wrote in her review, 
The outrageously profane South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut takes wicked wax at targets ranging from Saddam Hussein to the notion that the entertainment industry is chiefly to blame for the pollution of kids' culture. Despite the film's lampooning of the entertainment industry and censorship, South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut was a success in its own right. It was the highest grossing R-rated movie ever for a time, and the musical number Blame Canada even garnered an Academy Award nomination for Best Original Song. However, even the show's Oscar appearance garnered controversy with ABC censors ironically requesting the performance of the song be altered for airing. Meanwhile, Parker and Stone showed up to the prestigious ceremony after taking LSD, wearing dresses previously worn by Jennifer Lopez and Gwyneth Paltrow. While Parker and Stone are best known as the minds behind South Park for over 20 years, they've also made waves in the world of musical theater. Along with Frozen songwriter Robert Lopez, they co-created the smash hit Broadway musical The Book of Mormon. The nine-time Tony-winning show premiered in 2011 starring Andrew Rannells and Josh Cat as two Mormon missionaries who were sent to a poverty-stricken Ugandan village to spread their faith. Parker and Stone met Lopez after seeing his musical Avenue Q during the production of their film Team America World Police. Together, the trio bonded over their shared interest in musical theater and Mormonism. Parker and Stone grew up in a Mormon community in Colorado, hence their fascination. However, this interest didn't start with the Book of Mormon, as the duo had previously taken shots at the religion in earlier projects. In addition to their 1997 movie Orgasmo, which features Mormonism, the duo parodied the religion in Season 7 of South Park. The episode All About Mormons follows a Utah family moving to South Park and features a sequence explaining how Joseph Smith founded the religion. Even Mormons themselves have appreciated the jokes, with blogger Steve Evans writing for By Common Consent, South Park argues that the social aspects of our faith may be sufficient unto themselves, regardless of the efficacy of our ordinances or the historicity of our scriptures. And maybe Joseph Smith did make it all up. But I have a great life and a great family, and I have the Book of Mormon to thank for that. South Park has lampooned many celebrities over the course of its 26 seasons, garnering more than enough bad blood between the show's creators and famous figures. However, one of the series' most notable controversies came during their ninth season, when they parodied the Church of Scientology during the episode Trapped in the Closet. It famously featured a sequence depicting the Scientologist origin myth, as well as the implication that several celebrity Scientologists are actually closeted themselves. One person the South Park duo probably didn't anticipate angering was Isaac Hayes, the singer-songwriter who played the iconic role of Chef. Also a member of the Church of Scientology, Hayes announced in a statement prior to Season 10 that he would be departing the show for their disrespect to the religion. The matter became the subject of controversy for years to come, with Matt Stone telling the AP, We never heard a peep out of Isaac in any way until he did Scientology. He wants a different standard for religions other than his own. The circumstances of Hayes' departure have since been contradicted, with some reports saying that Hayes was also dissatisfied with pay or had suffered a stroke. Nevertheless, this meant the end of Chef's time on South Park, with a character being killed off in a season 10 premiere after being struck by lightning and mauled by wild animals. The speed at which the South Park production team moves has resulted in some pretty close calls when it comes to episodes airing. One of the most famous examples of this came during the show's 12th season, when the team decided to do an episode that would air the day after the 2008 presidential election without knowing who would win. The episode's production was entirely reliant on Trey Parker's hope that Barack Obama would defeat John McCain. The South Park co-creator told the Los Angeles Times that they considered making two versions of the episode, but it wasn't feasible. He elaborated, Well, we're just going to make the Obama version, and if McCain somehow wins, we're basically just totally screwed. Woo, Obama! Get out of here! Thankfully for them, Obama did inevitably win the election, allowing the team to proceed with the episode as is. However, they still incorporated some of his victory speech into the episode by the morning of the day the episode aired. It was also decided by Parker and the other members of the South Park team that the episode's plot would be removed from bipartisan politics. Instead, Obama and McCain would be attempting to pull off a jewel heist, while the political alignment of each recurring character was decided arbitrarily during production. Thankfully, no one had to worry for long about messing up the election prediction, but it made for an incredibly lucky call by Parker. South Park has been no stranger to the world of video games, receiving its first playable adaptation on the Nintendo 64 and PlayStation in 1998. Other South Park video games have been released over the years, but they're essentially existing games with a new coat of paint. That's why it eventually became a priority for Parker and Stone to faithfully translate the South Park experience into a video game. Their dream finally came true with South Park The Stick of Truth, which was released for PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and PC in 2014. While previous South Park video games had experimented with genres like first-person shooters and racing, The Stick of Truth is a role-playing game in which players control the new kid during a town-wide LARPing session. Though the game was developed by Obsidian Entertainment, Parker and Stone were heavily involved in the game's design. They took heavy inspiration from Nintendo's Earthbound, another popular RPG that Parker particularly loved. 
The game's development process was also subject to similar difficulties as the show itself. Censors in different countries resulted in humorous workarounds by the development team, including in one scene where Randy Marsh gets probed by aliens. Nevertheless, like the South Park TV show, The Stick of Truth was an incredible success critically and commercially. A sequel released in 2017, South Park The Fractured But Whole trades a medieval fantasy roleplay of The Stick of Truth for superhero alter egos. Like the rest of the entertainment industry, South Park was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks to the production team's quick turnaround time on creating episodes, though, they were able to release the pandemic special in September of 2020 as part of their 24th season. This hour-long special focuses on the town's reaction to COVID-19, as well as Randy Marsh's role in spreading it. It was then followed up in March 2021 with the South Park vaccination special, continuing the storyline by addressing vaccines and QAnon conspiracies. Look, you guys have a right to say and believe whatever you want, okay? But what you believe is really stupid. Later in 2021, South Park extended its deal with Comedy Central to produce the show for up to 30 seasons, including two films that were planned to be released that year. The first of them was South Park Post-COVID, a one-hour special followed up by a second hour, South Park Post-COVID, The Return of COVID. Unlike the pandemic special, the post-COVID specials did the impossible and took a look at the lives of the show's main cast 40 years into the future. The specials find Stan returning to South Park after Kenny has passed away, resulting in the trio of Stan, Kyle, and Cartman, who's now a rabbi, reuniting to finish research on a COVID-19 cure. Eventually, they discover that Kenny discovered time travel, so Stan and Kyle try using it to prevent the pandemic. They're unable to do so, but they still manage to improve the lives of everyone they know, except for Cartman. In 2022, South Park had its 25th anniversary. That was cause for celebration for Parker and Stone, who took the festivities to their home state of Colorado and put on an extravagant concert at the iconic Red Rocks Amphitheater in Morrison. The set list contained many musical hits from South Park history, including the Oscar-nominated Blame Canada from South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, and the anime-inspired ninja anthem Let's Fighting Love. The concert also featured special guests, with bands Ween and Primus supporting Stone and Parker throughout the concert. However, the biggest surprises were Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson from Rush, who surprised not only the audience, but Stone, too. Stone joined the duo on drums to perform the beloved Rush song Closer to the Heart. The once-in-a-lifetime concert was performed across two nights and later made available to watch on Paramount Plus and YouTube. It's a must-watch for any South Park fan, as they'll get to see the geniuses behind the show celebrate having one of the most successful animated shows of all time for 25 years. Here's the many more anniversaries on the horizon.